My name is Paul Levet. I'm one of the reference and instruction librarians of the Hemelfarb Library. And this presentation is on the ABCs of Systematic Review. As I mentioned, this session is being recorded. If you have your web camera on, if you could turn it off, that would be helpful. So I wanted to start out with a definition of systematic review, and I'll take this from the PRISMA reporting standard. A systematic review attempts to collect empirical evidence that fits pre-specified eligibility criteria that answers a specific research question, and uses explicit systematic methods that are selected with a view to minimizing bias. You are all familiar, I'm sure, with the concept of the evidence pyramid, at the top of which would be a well-conducted randomized control trial. There are many reasons why a randomized trial may not be possible, ethical reasons or other reasons as well, in which case observational studies like cohort studies will probably be the highest level of evidence that you'd find. But I like this illustration because it shows you how systematic reviews are a lens through which the evidence can be viewed. Before you start, check if a systematic review has already been done, and you can do this by looking in one of several databases. I would recommend PubMed or Medline, and limit the results to the systematic review publication type. The other databases listed here would also be good, depending on your subject area. The idea is to try to identify when was the most recent systematic review published and determine if now is the time for an update. Often a systematic review will be done before a clinical guideline will be updated. And the emphasis in this presentation tonight, as opposed to my previous presentation on carrying out literature review, is um, that systematic review is very much a team sport. Whereas a literature review can be reasonably carried out by an individual. A systematic review, particularly if you are following a reporting standard like the PRISMA methodology, requires at least two reviewers, plus a third to resolve conflicts among the decisions about what studies to include in the review. Other individuals that you'll probably want to have on your team will include possibly a librarian. If you wish to have a consult, you're very welcome to contact the reference staff at the Hemelfarb Health Sciences Library. We'll talk to you about candidate databases, um, but also how to search those databases more effectively. You may, at some point, if you are doing a review that is tracking a problem that has been well-defined and studied in like populations, in like settings, using similar methods, you may be able to generate a meta-analysis. And so if you wish to do that, you probably want to consult a statistician or an epidemiologist as well. One consideration you might want is to think about selecting reviewers that you work with, so your professional colleagues, or that at least have an affiliation with the same institution. Here it would be GW or Children's National Health System. If you don't, this may affect their ability to access regulated data, information, and copyrighted articles. And at the outset, you also wish to establish a realistic time frame based on your collective obligations and also how exhaustive you wish to make your search of the literature and the process of screening candidate articles, appraising the ones that you wish to review and analyzing them. So for the first steps that you would carry out, you would want to identify the databases that index the medical literature on your topic. And this is where talking to a librarian can help. Um, we do publish research guides on the Himmelfarb Library website. Many of these reflect the departmental structure in the schools of medicine, public health, and nursing. So we have guides, for instance, on global health, exercise science, emergency medicine, and all kinds of other topics as well. And each of those is 
going to list databases that will index journals in that field. And as I say, you're also welcome to talk to us and we'll assign a librarian to talk with you about that. And also how to search those databases, the actual search syntax that you want to carry out. If you are updating a pre-existing systematic overview, the good news is some of that work has already been done before. And I am very much a believer in not recreating the wheel. If you can build on the work somebody else has done, find a pre-existing literature review, then you maybe all you need to do at this point is to carry out an update. Um, but consider if that update is actually worthwhile. So has there been some advance in medical technology or in terms of guidelines or in survival rates or whatever that merits an, another look at the literature since the last time a review was published? Uh, you ought to do some preliminary searches and background reading around the topic. Then convene your review team to discuss your inclusion or exclusion criteria and other review protocol items. And we'll see that on the next slide. Uh, and then at this point, you would then carry that out and register your protocol in the Prospero database. Prospero is a registry of systematic reviews in progress. So Prospero requires that you agree and report these items, your rationale for carrying out the review, uh, what its contribution is to clinical decision making, whether there's enough relevant literature to merit a systematic review, and that's another reason why you want to carry out that preliminary scoping review to see what, what has been published, uh, your inclusion exclusion criteria, um, then these items of interest, so the population that you're studying, interventions that have been tried, any comparisons, if there are any, um, what sort of outcomes you expect to find, uh, and what types of study uh, you wish to review. So this is where you draw on your knowledge of the types of study that are published in the medical literature. And there are a lot of very good textbooks that can help you to identify these different types of studies. The JAMA User's Guide to the Medical Literature is an excellent starting point. Um, the sources that you use to search the literature, so listing some of the databases, the screening methods you carry out, how you plan to extract data, how you plan to assess the studies in your review for bias, and your own contact details. So this is an example of a Prospero registration. Uh, these were three hematologists at Children's National Health System, and they were investigating this problem, there's a ureteral reflux in children. And you see that this record has been assigned a number that begins CRD. So this is a good database to search if you wish to see if somebody is already carrying out a review or an update on your topic. But at a minimum, when you want to carry out your search, you will need to search at least these three databases. Um, Medline or PubMed, because PubMed contains the entirety of Medline. Embase or Scopus, which contains the content of Embase, and the Cochrane Central Trials Register. This is just the minima. On top of this, you will want to search additional databases that index your subject area. And so you can have a look at our library subject research guide, or you can have a look at the suggestions for other sources on my systematic review guide. And the link is in the handout I sent to you earlier. And this will list other um, gray literature sources. So um, the progress dissertations and theses database would be a good one to look at because most dissertations will have a literature review chapter. That can be a source of good ideas. Um, conference proceedings and posters are something else that uh, can contain data. And also uh, the non-peer reviewed literature as well. And the extent to which you wish to use this type of um, additional material uh, to collect data is, is entirely up to you. Uh, and as I say, it just depends on the level of rigor that you wish to, to carry out your systematic review. Uh, but to give you some idea, the very large Cochrane collaboration review groups will sometimes spend um, several months hand searching each issue of particular journals in order to try to identify candidate articles. So they go into um, 
levels of detail you probably won't need to go but as i say it just depends on your topic your next steps would be to document your literature search by recording the number of results you find on a spreadsheet and it's good practice to save your searches as you go along so create accounts in these databases so for example with pubmed create a my ncbi account and save your work there because there's nothing more frustrating than uh, having spent a couple of hours doing a, a very detailed search and then you leave your workstation and you have to do something else so save your work as you go along so you're not constantly having to redo it save and organize the candidate abstract records uh, and you can use any of the bibliographic databases like RefWorks or Mendeley or whatever works for you and note if that's how you prefer to use it um, a lot of these have tools like RefWorks does that will help you to deduplicate results and organize the abstracts for your screening. Then your next step would be to carry out your first pass screening. This is where you and the other reviewer, perhaps you can assign the initial candidate result set between you because you may have several hundred records to have to screen. So maybe numbers one to 500 your colleague, you take 501 to 1000, whatever. Uh, read the title and abstract and apply your inclusion and exclusion criteria. And you record your decision whether or not to review and the reason on your spreadsheet. And your next step, after you have screened all of these articles and have made your decisions, is to acquire, save, and share the full text of the PDFs of the articles of only those articles that pass this first pass screening. You don't need to save the full text of everything that you find first go around. You can generally screen out 80 or 90% of the false positive results on just by reading the title and abstract with your inclusion exclusion criteria. This is an example spreadsheet to record your decisions. This spreadsheet has a tab for each database that was searched and then a tab for the number of duplicates removed. And then this tab lists the decision. So whether or not to include it, yes or no, a brief reason for exclusion if it was excluded. And the first column is some way to identify each individual paper. This can be any number as long as it's unique to that paper and you can get back to that paper quickly. So I suggest using the PMID number, PubMed it has a unique record number for every uh, article record that's in the PubMed database, and that's this PMID number. When you have screened out on the first pass screening and you wish to save the full text PDFs, you can use a tool called GW Box in order to do that. And one uh, tip I would give would be to use that unique identifying number as part of the file name for the PDFs, then you have a one-to-one -one relationship as well. One of the advantages of using GW Box over Google Drive or just storing it on the School of Medicine network are that uh, the box allows you to save regulated data and all of the PDFs are copyrighted so that would be one reason to keep them in. It's a fairly large uh, number of files you can keep, 15 gigabytes, uh, which would certainly incorporate uh, most reviews that I can think that you might wish to do. And it also allows you to share those files with the individuals outside of GW. Yes, I know at the start I said suggested finding collaborators who work in your institution but of course you may need to work with subject matter experts outside so box lets you do that and the reason for that is the it people here at gw have an agreement with the vendor that keeps the data on servers in the united states whereas google drive it could be stored anywhere so that's why they don't let you uh, do that the next steps would be to um read compare and appraise the articles for your review so at this second level screening this is where you read the full text with your inclusion exclusion criteria and you may still at this point after having read the actual articles 
the actual study, decide, no, I don't wish to include this in my review. And that's okay, you can do that. So just record your screening decision and reason for why you chose to exclude it. Having read possibly 50 to 100 articles now in completion, you can identify what are some of the commonly reported metrics, measures, interventions, and results that you wish to compare across studies. So you'll need to create a data extraction form listing those items so that you can pull that out. So print one form for each study you review and then just pull the numbers out and put them on and you'll end up with a stack of forms. You'll also need to critically appraise each article. So uh, to do that, you can use one of a number of grading criteria for your topic and we'll have a look at that in a moment. So here is an example on the left of a data extraction form. This was for a small scale review of interventions to increase emergency department throughput. So here are some of the metrics, measures, and interventions and study types and so on that this physician was interested in comparing across studies. So you would do something very similar. And then for grading and critical appraisal, if you go to my systematic review guide, there's a tab called reporting the quality of risk of bias. And it suggests some grading criteria that you may wish to apply. Uh, the simplest is probably the grade criteria. It just has two levels, strong and weak recommendations. But you might wish to use some sort of number scale where the higher the score, the higher the quality. And Haddad can help you to do that. Um, what you should do, though, is uh, read other systematic reviews on this topic that you're investigating and try to work out what grading criteria or what critical appraisal system other subject matter experts in your field use and expect to find because there's no point in arbitrarily picking one of these grading systems if nobody in your field is going to be interested in using it or if they consider it to be um, you know, irrelevant to what they're doing. So for instance, if you were an environmental occupational health professional, then you would be interested in using the navigation guide and using that to grade the papers with. And that gives a measure of the uh, toxicity. So uh, whether or not a, it's a toxic exposure or not toxic or possibly toxic. So you grade um, things that way. So just it's subject specific is what I'm trying to say. And then your next steps would be to write up your results. So if you're following the PRISMA methodology, PRISMA expects you to uh, put together a flow diagram uh, summarizing your literature search. And this is where you can just pull out the numbers that you recorded on the spreadsheet to populate the different levels of the flow diagram. Uh, PRISMA also asks you to put together a table of study characteristics. You can do this using your data extraction forms. So one row for each study in your review, the column headings match the data items for comparison, and then you just add the grade that you assign to each study. Now you can choose to do a meta-analysis or a meta-synthesis, and this might be a value if you're doing uh, investigating a question where you can only collect observational data, and uh, again, only if you found enough studies of sufficient quality using the same methods to merit one. Uh, but there is a backlash against meta-analyses without critical appraisal right now. So just be aware that just including a forest plot in and of itself doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be accepted for publication. They're going to want to see evidence that you have critically appraised the studies in your literature review. And finally, write up your manuscript following the PRISMA 27 item checklist. And with any systematic review or any literature review, the most interesting sections to write are going to be the discussion and recommendation section. This is where you bring your own expert opinion to bear with the evidence that you found to back up the recommendations that you make. So here's an example of the PRISMA flow diagram. And you see here that each box along the top row is one of the databases that was searched with the numbers found. So as I said, at the minimum, this is searched 
PubMed or Medline and Basel Scopus and the Cochrane Central Trials Register. In addition, this study looks at clinicaltrials.gov as well. Uh, but as I say, this is going to differ and be as long as necessary, depending on what your subject area is. This is the first level screening that you carried out. So after deduplication, the number of candidate articles and the large number that was excluded just after reading the title and abstract with your inclusion exclusion criteria in hand. This second level screening, this much smaller number, this was the number of full text articles that was actually collected, saved and shared between the reviewers. And again, at this point, they decided to exclude some of the articles. So this final row just summarizes the actual number of articles that were reviewed. Prism also asks you to put together this table of study characteristics. Here is what one looks like. As I said, each row is a study in the review. Each column is one of those metrics measures or interventions or outcomes that is to be compared between studies. So this data was collected on the data extraction forms. As I mentioned, there is currently uh, some backlash from uh, physicians and clinicians against uh, meta-analysis without critical appraisal. So try to follow the PRISMA method, try to follow a recognized grading criteria for your topic. Uh, and I will put in a plug here for the Oxford Center for Evidence-Based Medicine. They have a, a set of critical appraisal worksheets uh, that you'll find that are very useful um, for different types of studies. So you can't really see them at the bottom here, but they have ones for therapy studies, uh, for diagnostic studies, for prognosis studies. Um, and these critical appraisal sheets can help certainly um, carry out an informed analysis of the records, the articles, the, the studies that you are reviewing. And so that your recommendations have some weight behind them. And so that you've considered the rigor with which the studies were carried out, whether or not they used the appropriate statistical uh, measures in order to uh, present the data, whether those statistical measures were appropriate for the question, whether or not a hypothesis was tested or generated, that kind of thing. Uh, 